uh, at the uh, Purrington House, uh, particularly because I, I grew up in the Purrington House. And here is a picture that I'm uh, holding for you, just to tell you a little bit uh, very quickly about the Purrington House. It was built in 1874-75 by George Purrington, Jr. And he and his wife, Olivia Freeman Purrington, moved into the house in 1875. They had one child, Florence, and Florence was a concert uh, violinist and didn't marry until she was 40 years old in 1910. And it just so happened that she married my grandfather, Charles Mendel Sr. Uh, Charles Mendel Sr. had been married once before. Uh, his wife had unfortunately passed away. And so in 1910, right out here on what was a veranda but is now the porch, it's been glassed in, uh, the uh, wedding took place. And so Florence Purrington Mendel and her husband Charles uh, had a son, Charles Jr., who was my dad. And so that's my claim to this house. And uh, I grew up here as a young boy, primarily in the summers, uh, between 1933 when I was born and 1953 when I moved on to the great wide world. Uh, but I have many wonderful experiences, but that's another whole topic. <laughs> at any rate, let's get back to the uh, topic at hand. Uh, just a quick review. Uh, some of you heard me last time. Uh, it, ha it is on DVD. It has been shown once or twice on uh, public television. The trouble is they showed it at 2 in the afternoon and not everyone watches at that time. Uh, but a quick review. Uh, we talked about the Hammonds and the Barlows and the Dexters as being the first families to arrive here in 1680. And they moved into what was called the Lands of Sipacan which stretched all the way from the Weeweeannock River uh, over in Wareham to uh, Fairhaven, East Fairhaven. They cleared land, uh, built their houses, log houses first, uh, farms, raised food, and once they had established themselves and other people of course came into the area uh, as well, uh, they turned to trade because these weren't our pioneers that went westward. These were people that bought into the lands of Sipacan as an investment. And with the harbor here and the harbor in Sipacan and the harbor in the mouth of the Weeweeannock, uh, they built their little vessels and carried on trade, trading products of the forest because this vast tract of land that ran from the shores of Buzzards Bay inland up through uh, Lakeville was about 70 square miles of really virgin timber uh, that the Indians, the Wampanoags, had lived on for a thousand years or so. At any rate, uh, Hammondtown uh, became the center of the settlement here in what we call Mattapoisett and Lieutenant, John's Hammond, Lieutenant John Hammond's house became the center of the uh, village of Hammond Town. His brother Captain Ben, Benjamin Hammond and Sloop Dolphin uh, sailed out of the salt pond at the head of the Mattapoisett River and that's what they used for their little harbor. There were no houses down on the waterfront in what we call now the village. They're all at Hammond Town or out in Dexter Town, which was at Pine Island, Crescent Beach, and out uh, to Strawberry and Angelica. Thank you. 
at any rate, uh, trade. That's what these people came. They wanted to make a profit, and so were the products of the forest, all kinds of uh, wooden implements, as well as the boards and the planks and the cordwood and the shingles and the fence posts and the fence rails, so on and so forth, that they, they traded. Uh, and that led, of course, to the, nether, the third cornerstone in Mattapoisett's history, farming, trade, shipbuilding, because as they began to trade more and more, they needed to, uh, they did more and more vessels. Because one of the problems they had with the trade was that were pirates. And remember we talked quite a bit about the pirates last time, uh, the one by the name of Pound and the one by the name of Hoskins, but eventually they were rounded up and hung, you remember, in uh, Newport. Uh, as the trade developed and the uh, shipbuilding developed, the voyages began to go further and further afield. They didn't just trade with Newport now or New Bedford or with Nantucket or up around the Cape in Boston. They began to go further afield down to the Caribbean. And uh, they, uh, <clears throat> they traded for sugar and molasses and rum and tobacco and cotton and brought it back here to uh, good old Mattapoisett or to the communities along uh, Budget Bay here, or villages as I should call them. And the, uh, the Barlows and the Hammonds and the Dexters that uh, sailed on these vessels now began to have their eyes opened when they went down to the Caribbean and saw that there was a whole different way of life down in the south where a few people lived at the top and many, many slaves were at the bottom. And that was a big change from workaday New England where people worked from dawn to dusk to scratch out a living. There were wars that went on during this period of time when our first uh, people or residents were here in uh, Mattapoisett. Uh, one was the, we talked about this last time, King William's War in, in uh, 1688 to 1699 uh, was a, a war uh, in, in England but it translated over here to the colonies and the phrase that we use, remember that when when Europe sneezed, the world had a cold. And that was because uh, the European countries had colonies all over the world. And so what happened, England and France were on opposite sides. And of course the French were in Canada and the English were here on the eastern seaboard. And so the clash followed right over to the Atlantic, across the Atlantic. And so we were all members of the crown, remember, and uh, are citizens of the crown, or, or uh, subjects of uh, Her Majesty or His Majesty, and so off to war we had to go. And the second little war is where we're starting fresh now, is Queen Anne's War in 1702 to 1714. This in Europe was called the War of the Spanish Succession. King Louis in France wanted a Bourbon king on the throne of Spain, whereas England and Austria wanted a Habsburg uh, king on the throne of Spain. Well, that war erupted again over here onto the colonies. And for a second time, the French aggravated the Indians along the northern frontier and got them steamed up against the English. And so the colonists, we were really involved and this was the time of the Deerfield Massacre, only a hundred miles away when the Indians swept in in 1704 and uh, massacred the inhabitants. Uh, also, as far as we're concerned with the water end of it, the ocean, uh, when England 
and France were opposed to each other, so it was at sea. And so French privateers now, along with the pirates, preyed on trade that went up and down our sea coast. I remember that anything of any bulk or anything period that had to be moved was moved by water in those days, but as soon as you went inland at all, there were hardly any trails at all. All livelihood was along the, the sea coast. Uh, <coughs> sailors, uh, the, as a matter of fact, a, uh, the uh, ship of the line came into Buzzards Bay uh, off Mattapoisett Harbor and sent in their longboats and literally like impressing sailors much later in the War of 1815, rounded up colonists from the seashore and took them uh, off for five months uh, to sail uh, Her Majesty's ships. Uh, Captain Ben Ham Hammond was one of those that uh, had to go. Eventually, France was defeated and Nova, uh, defeated in two battles uh, uh, and driven out of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Uh, pirates also, uh, again, a uh, man by the name of Bellamy. Bellamy was a pirate. He had several ships and he actually closed down the bay. No vessels could get out of it, closed down the sound. And so uh, our local skippers, of which Captain Ben Hammond was one with his dolphin, Sam Price was another who lived up on the what would now be the, the town line of Rochester Mass and Mattapoisett, and Captain Ruggles, another, uh, petitioned the Great and General Court in Plymouth uh, for help. And the great, the great and General Court in Plymouth said, well, we can't help you, but we will deputize you to go out and get them on your own, and we will pay you five pounds for every dead pirate you deliver. <laughs> That's the truth. And 10 pounds for every cannon. Cannon were more valuable than men. At any rate, eventually the king ships came and we rounded up the pirates and they were hung in Newport on July 19, 1723. And also what happened too was a storm that blew some of uh, Bellamy's ships ashore uh, so that the local residents could, uh, could deal with them. All right, now we slip into a, a different topic, and that is for more than 30 years now, uh, merchants of Boston and Newport and New York had been shipping whale oil to London. And whaling really was being carried on off the tip of Cape Cod, Provincetown, Long Island, and more importantly for us, Nantucket. And uh, this was a, a lucrative business. Uh, there was a great market for whale oil, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. And so that Captain Ben, Ben Hammond, and others that had been out on their sloops in the waters off Newport and uh, around the vineyard and Nantucket, as they had taken their loads of products of the forest, had seen these whales spouting. And uh, they too thought uh, it might be easier, certainly more profitable, to sell whale oil than to uh, go into the forest and cut all this material and load it on your boats and so forth. And so they too started uh, whaling, in those days was called greasy voyages because they would uh, take the blubber off the whale and uh, load it on the decks of their vessels and bring it back to shore to have the oil boiled out. And uh, many of the younger, uh, younger Dexters and Barlows and Hammond, Hammonds were, were laying down their rakes and their hoes and picking up harpoons and cutting spades. In other words, everybody was beginning to get into this, this whaling uh, venture. And there were many stories and tales to be told, of course, about smashed boats and <coughs> uh, Nantucket sleigh rides and things of this type 
on a cold winter's night when you're sitting around the hearth, you spin a yarn or two. But let me talk a little bit about whales now and, uh, and New Bedford because we're going to really start to move into Mattapoisett's professional shipbuilding era, right? That's going to last about 125 to 130 years. And, uh, but if New Bedford hadn't become the whaling capital of the world, uh, we wouldn't have become the shipbuilding port that we were, because you have to have a market for ships, and with New Bedford right there as the capital of the whaling industry, uh, we had that ready market. Well, whaling started in the colonies uh, off of Nantucket, and I suppose you could say the sand dunes of uh, the Cape as well, but mainly on Nantucket, where the Nantucketers built uh, watchtowers on the sand dunes. And, uh, from their watchtowers, they looked for the spouts of the migrating right whale that made their annual trips from the Caribbean. They had the right idea from the Caribbean in the uh, where they spent the winter months, and in the summer they came <laughs> north, right, and uh, passed right by off the tip of the Cape and uh, Nantucket on up off. Uh, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and uh, the Grand Banks where they would feed and so on and so forth. And so the Nantucketers would uh, see the spouts of the whales, pull their boats off the uh, shore, row out, harpoon the whale, get towed, and that's why it's called a Nantucket sleigh ride, because whaling in the colonies started in Nantucket and uh, there was a Nantucket sleigh ride to be towed by the whale. And you people are all natives of this area and uh, know that the way that they kill these wonderful beasts was to let them tow the whale boat for an hour or two and exhaust themselves. And then they went up to the whale for a second time and lanced it and let it uh, bleed to death. Uh, unfortunately, we don't whale anymore. Uh, the other thing that... Uh, you want to know is that whale oil was a much sought after commodity at this time. And notice I'm, I'm talking about 1650 here. And remember when we talked last time, we, we pointed out that uh, people became disgruntled with the uh, Puritan regime, so to speak, in both the Plymouth colony and the Bay colony, and they began to strike out on their own. And so groups went down the Cape and out to Nantucket and down the coast to uh, Rhode Island and to Connecticut. And so uh, starting about 1650, 1660 along in there is the period that we are, are we talking about. And uh, if you wanted, and it's long before petroleum and there was no, no kerosene, petroleum didn't come along until uh, the 1850s. At any rate, if you wanted light in your home or wherever, you had an open fire or the, or the fire in your hearth, uh, or you made yourself some kind of a, or used a dish and took animal fat, uh, pig fat, uh, bear fat, uh, any kind of vegetable oil, or whatever you could get, and you put in a a wick, some kind of a, a rag or whatnot, and you made yourself kind of a, a crude lamp that uh, you lit with a match and it gave you a very orange, smoky, smelly flame and uh, a little bit of light. Now, the key here is that whale oil burns very clear, very bright, and with hardly any odor at all. And so it was pure and simply a lamp fuel. Now, later on, it, it also becomes a lubricant for the Industrial Revolution, but, but not right away. It was strictly a lamp fuel, and the, the lamps that lit the world, and that's the, the motto of the New Bedford Whaling Museum, so to speak, uh, whale oil. And so that's why P. 
people would go on Nantucket sleigh ride, so to speak, get their whale, tow it back to shore, and of course, you know, they, they sliced off the blubber and put it in large kettles and they boiled it. And whale oil, a whale blubber when it's boiled, is just like if we put uh, bacon in a skillet, right? Except uh, we throw away the grease, oil, and eat the bacon. They skimmed out the bacon, the, the part of the blubber that didn't dissolve as it boiled and threw it in underneath and it fueled the fire to the whale literally cooked himself once you got the flame going uh, with wood. And uh, that was the way you rendered your, your whale oil. And uh, now remember, whales were mammals, right? And uh, probably at one time, not probably, at one time they were land animals. They looked something between a cross of a cow and uh, a horse. And for some reason, long, long ago, they went into the sea. And of course, many things happened to them over the millions of years. Uh, their nose migrated from the tip of their, what we call their nose, uh, up to the top of the head became their blowhole where they could breathe when they surfaced. Their hind legs withered away and dropped off and they developed a tail with a horizontal fluke. You know, sharks have the up and down, vertical whales is down. The big powerful fluke for the uh, locomotion. And the flippers began, the forelegs became, you know, up against the side which they used. The humpback whale is the one, the only one that really has them today. That's the one they take the pictures of on the advertisement. They, they throw out these big uh, flippers. But the most important thing for the for us and our lamp fuel is that when this mammal went into the sea, he went into a slightly hostile environment because being a mammal, his body temperature is the same as ours, 98.6, and he had to keep himself warm. And so over those millions of years, he developed this thick layer of what we call blubber of very fatty, sinewy uh, material, and that's where the whale oil is. Uh, most of the whales that they were uh, catching, the blubber was anywhere from 8 to 10 or so inches thick, but if you go up to the bowhead whale in the, Atlant in the Arctic, 22 inches thick. Right? So uh, <clears throat> that's the story of whales and why whale whaling was such a profitable business there was a real uh, market for whale oil. Well, of course, like all good humans, the Nantucketers and the Long Islanders and the Cape Codders plucked all the low fruit or the close whales and they began to have to go further afield, which they did. And they went out in their sloops and their schooners in the 1690s, let's move up a little bit now, and started these greasy voyages that I mentioned a minute ago and they peeled the blubber off while the whale was right there in the water rather than going all the way back to the beach but laid all this greasy blubber on the deck and brought it back to shore to boil it out. Uh, in 1712 a whaling schooner out of uh, Nantucket got uh, in the nor'easter, of course, which we're familiar with, got blown out into the Gulf Stream. And for the first time, these Nantucketers uh, got a, a sperm whale. Now, a, a sperm whale is a different type of whale than the right whale or the humpback whale. Those two whales are what we call the baleen whale. They're surface feeders. They swim along and take in tremendous amounts of water full of krill and shrimp and haddock and mackerel or whatever and then close it and I always think of the baleen as toothbrushes on their gums the, 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 the bristles interlock and with their tongue which can weigh up to seven tons they push out uh, all the water and swallow uh, what's left. But the sperm whale is the largest of the toothed whales. Now a porpoise of the same family porpoise have teeth, 
porpoise or mammals, all right? But the sperm whale is the largest of these toothed whales, and they realized that the sperm whale had some byproducts that were very valuable as well as the oil that comes out of the blubber. Certainly they found out that these teeth were all ivory, like the tusks of a walrus or, a, or an elephant. They also uh, found that in the head of the sperm whale was what they call a case, which was really like a huge barrel of vat, and in it was a very waxy oil, which was called spermaceti. Very waxy oil, it was ideal for making candles. And a sperm, spermaceti candle was sought after by the wealthy everywhere. You could put a spermaceti candle in Grandmama's parlor in a Newport mansion with its laced curtains and all and burn it all night and in the morning there'd be no soot anywhere, and no smell, no nothing. So very important byproduct. Uh, why does a sperm whale have that big vat of oil there? Well, the scientists tell us the reason he has that vat of oil up there is that sperm whales are deep divers. They don't feed on the surface like the baleen whales. They feed on the bottom and eat squid. They like to call them gigantic squid, giant squid, but just squid will do. And they, they chew them up and swallow them but the squid live on the bottom, and uh, sperm whales are most prevalent in the Pacific, and we know the Pacific is a very deep ocean. Sperm whales can dive 10,000 feet. That's two miles. And so they feel that this case of oil up there is his decompression chamber. That's where his inner ear and his semicircular canal, or semi, uh, semicircular canal is, uh, that his balance system and the, the whole, whole business. And so it's decompression chamber. The other question, of course, that you ask, if you dive that deep, how does he see what's going on down there because it's pitch black? Well, the sperm whale has a very sophisticated sonar system, uh, rivals our Navy. And they can, in the inky black depth down there, zero right in on these uh, squid. They can even emit a, uh, a sound, a penetrating sound that stuns their prey and then feed on it. But let's not labor that. Let's just say that this was our first experience now with a sperm whale and sperm whale all through the whaling era is the whale of choice because it has the spermaceti and it has the uh, ivory. Uh, it wasn't until 1750 that triworks were put aboard the, the whale vessels. We don't really have whale ships yet, whaling vessels, sloops and schooners, like the Ernestina. Uh, they, starting in 1750, one wise soul said, well look, it would be a lot simpler if we could boil the oil out, since we're going to do it anyway, out here and just bring back the oil rather than all this smelly foul blubber. So that's exactly what they began to do. Well at any rate, through this whole period now, and as we march up towards the revolution, 1750-1775, uh, the great merchants of uh, Nantucket were making their money. The Starbucks, the Macy's, the Freemans, the Roaches. This is when these people were really starting to uh, build up their wealth and the whaling empire and actually Nantucket was the center of whaling until New Bedford comes along sometime after uh, 1800 in its, its development. So that's how and why these uh, Hammond Towners or Mattapoiseters and others from our north shore of Buzzards Bay here wanted to get into the whaling industry. Profit. All right, now let's say a word about New Bedford because we've got to get New Bedford into a position to where it is going to be the whaling capital and the tremendous market for uh, Mattapoiset ships. And so again we go back to that magical date of about 1650, 1652 when disgruntled people were leaving the bay 
and the Plymouth colonies. And this time uh, we have a group of Quakers and Baptists led by uh, John Russell and Benjamin Tabor and they uh, met over in the Dartmouth area, same place we think about today, and in those days Dartmouth area included all of New Bedford all the way over to uh, uh, Westport. And they worked a deal with Chief Massasoit and his son Warm Setter. And uh, as the story goes, they traded a whole, just a stack of blankets for this uh, whole tract of land. Now, whether that is true or not, probably there were a few other things written in. But uh, the, the Wampanoags actually uh, befriended, you know, the Englishman. Uh, it wasn't until King Philip came along, as we said last time, we had the King Philip War. But in these early days, the Wampanoags really saved the life of the Plymouth uh, of the pilgrims up there. Uh, when they came over in 1620 in that first, uh, first winter. And so, in, in a sense, just as we were talking about uh, Madame Poisset with the Barlows and the uh, Hammonds and the Dexters, in, in, a, in 1660 there were three families that had moved into what we call now the uh, New Bedford area, uh, actually more up the Cushnet River on the Fairhaven side, Howard's Neck, and by 1664, there were 12 families that lived there, and they petitioned the great and general court of Plymouth to allow them to call themselves the Dartmouth Settlement, which they did. And in the next 10 years, or 11 years to 1675, there were some 30 families that uh, were living and farming on the upper re reaches and uh, the head of the harbor, so to speak, at what we call uh, New Bedford today, up where all the mills are north of uh, 195, all up, up uh, through there. But then, uh, as we saw in, uh, last, uh, in the last talk, chapter one, uh, along came King Philip's War and just turned everything upside down, terrible atrocities on each side, the whole Dartmouth complex was was uh, burned, but finally, by 1680, uh, the Indians were laid to rest, so to speak, and uh, within another 10 years, in 1690, people began to return uh, to the Dartmouth area. And in 1700, uh, Joseph Russell II, it had been his father, Joseph Russell I, that had uh, uh, work with Chief Massasoit with a stack of blankets, and now his son uh, settles down in what we call New Bedford today, uh, right there on the waterfront. And uh, by 1735, they had laid out the streets, Union Street that's there today, and Water Street were uh, laid out. And again, the Great and General Court was petitioned to name this area uh, here on the waterfront of New Bedford, to name it Bedford Village, not New Bedford. It won't be New Bedford till after the British burn it in 1878. But it's Bedford Village, and the reason they wanted to name it Bedford Village, that the Russell family that I have mentioned here were, were related to the Dukes of Bedford, of England, and so they wanted to bring that family name over, and so they established the Bedford Village. And so uh, uh, Bedford Village was established, the streets that I mentioned were laid out, and the shipyards are started to build ships, and they began also their greasy voyages. Uh, names of, of the, I won't say the first two ships because who knows, but two ships that early vessels that were built there in New Bedford were the Concord and the Dartmouth. All right, a very interesting thing happened in, uh, six, in, in uh, 1765. Okay, I'm jumping up a, a little bit now because it's going to lay the groundwork for New Bedford. Uh, <coughs> 
1750s, I say, the streets were laid out in Bedford Village. Some 15 years later now, uh, Joseph Roach, one of the wealthy whaling merchants from uh, Nantucket, came and moved his whole whaling business. His, in other words, he had a string of ships, everything brought his expertise and his people and moved into New Bedford. All right? And I suppose lots of eyes went up. Why would so successful out there move his whole business and operation into New Bedford? Well, he could probably see handwriting on the wall. And the handwriting on the wall told him this, that as the demand for whale oil increased, which it was, there was a huge market in Europe, all the affluent cities, we were beginning to develop our own coastline down with uh, Newport, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Savannah, Charleston, right? There was a huge market for uh, this whale oil. You had to go further and further afield for whale oil. To go further and further afield for whale oil and make your voyage profitable, you needed larger ships so you could bring back more whale oil on every one. What was the problem in Nantucket? Shallow harbor. A sandbar that they couldn't get rid of and still can't get rid of today <laughs> across the mouth of that harbor. And plus, it's a, it's a shallow harbor anyway. Uh, and so they couldn't get the ships in. They'd have to offload them outside. And Nantucket doesn't have a very nice, doesn't have a great big Buzzards Bay like we do to protect from ocean swells. I mean, we never have any ocean swells. I mean, if you're in a small boat in Buzzards Bay, you'll say, oh, pretty bad job. But we don't get the big ocean swells. And so New Bedford, deep water harbor, protected by a bay, was an ideal place to bring your whaling industry on expertise. And so this gave New Bedford a tremendous jump, uh, jump start, if you want, into the whaling business. All right, so we've, we've looked at early Mattapoisett now. We've gone from farming to trade, shipbuilding, and whaling as the cornerstones. Now let's see what's actually happening in Mattapoisett, and we've got just about 15 minutes to go. Uh, in 1737, we're in the 1700s now, so bear with me. Uh, 1737, there were uh, 52 families that lived in Mattapoisett, but that doesn't mean uh, Mattapoisett Village. There were still no, no buildings on the waterfront at all. They were all, these 52 families were spread out everywhere, from Hammond Town to Brand Island to Tinkham Town to Wolf Island to Randall Town to Pine Island to Arcoot. And the largest, of course, was Hammond Town down at the mouth of the Mattapoisett River and along up the uh, banks of the uh, Mattapoisett River. Uh, 1637 also saw the first church built in Mattapoisett, but again, Hammond Town. Uh, <clears throat> it, uh, it was built at the corner of what was called Jenny's Corner, Zion, Zion Hill, uh, where River Road and the Kushnet uh, meet, Kushnet Roads meet. And uh, you may recall that last time I said that the church that these earliest settlers went to was Minister's Rock over in East Marion. And they used to have to, people from Mattapoisett, then there was no road along the shore, had to go to uh, Rochester and then down into Marion. And then eventually they built a church in Rochester, but still inhabitants here every Sunday had to go up to Rochester. And finally, in 1737, they said enough of that and uh, built a church at Jenny's Corner, right there at the corner of River Road and Akushnet Road. Uh, they had several uh, reverends in the, uh, in the early days. Uh, first guy was a, uh, first reverend, excuse me, uh, was Elisa uh, Tupper, 
but he was not well liked at all, and he was sent on his way. The uh, next one was a man by the name of uh, Reverend Ivory Hoovey. Uh, he was very popular. Uh, they liked him. And there were, there were many, many uh, deacons also. And I've heard uh, Betty Roberts tell this little story that uh, Deacon, uh, Deacon Elder Barstow uh, <laughs> lost his wife. Uh, she passed away. And, it, and uh, this points out uh, a very important point back in those early days. Uh, it was very tough, practically impossible to go it on your own. You, you had to have a counterpart, a man, a woman, or a woman, a man, and uh, helpful if you had children too that would go up and begin to share the burden of all of the, all of the chores. And so Deacon Barstow was uh, looking for a wife and so he went out on his house on his horse one morning and uh, drove by the house of a uh, recently widowed woman and she was uh, outside in her little garden and he drove by and said good morning ma'am and they passed pleasantries and he said I'll be right up front probably didn't use the words but, uh, the other <laughs> words but he said I'll come right to the point Come right to the point. I'm looking for a wife, and uh, if you're interested, if you'll have me, I'll get down and come in. And she looked up at him and gave one of her big smiles and said, "Why, Deacon, get right down off that horse and come in." <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, <clears throat> uh, we got punctuated here now as. Uh, Hammond Town and uh, surrounds these 52 families uh, were growing with another war. Uh, this was King George's War, uh, again fought up on the uh, boundary, Canadian border between the uh, French and uh, the British. Uh, fortunately, it was not too long a war in the 1740s. All right, now we get to a real dividing point in Mattapoise's history. In the 1750s, the first of the professional shipbuilders arrive in Mattapoisett. And the first professional shipbuilder to arrive in Mattapoisett was a man by the name of Charles Stetson. And the reason I say professional shipbuilding, I remember last time we talked about the vessels, the sloops and the slallops. What's that? Shallops, no. right, shallops and uh, schooners that they were building down the salt pond were, were built by what they call right of eye, so to speak. And they were clumsy uh, and wouldn't beat the weather very well, but uh, they could carry a cargo. And so they had sufficed. Uh, but now with uh, the merchant trade going all the way down to the Caribbean and actually across the Atlantic as well with uh, loads of whale oil, it became important. There was a market for ships now and not our schooners and our sloops. And up on Boston's North Shore and South Shore, as well as in Boston, they had been building ships now for almost half a century because remember the Bay Colony got its start way back in the 1630s. At any rate, Charles Stetson uh, came from Situate, and he came down to Mattapoisett, and he bought land from Deacon Constant Dexter. And the Dexters, as we said, lived out to Brant Island, uh, excuse me, Pine Island, and around Crescent Beach, and actually Ned's Point, and you know, into the vi village as well. They owned that land, and so from Deacon Constance Dexter, uh, Charles Stetson bought a tract of land on our waterfront that ran roughly all the way from uh, Pearl Street uh, up to about Barstow Street. Right? He bought the, the waterfront, uh, so to speak. And he set up his uh, boat yard at the head or the foot of uh, Pearl Street. And that really was the first shipyard to be built in 
because you didn't build a shipyard in those days. You built a ship on a piece of land, and that was your shipyard. And he built a house, his house across the street from it. Uh, you can argue uh, the Gibbons live there now. Uh, the house still stands. Uh, either 1752 or 1754, somewhere along in there, that house where the Gibbons live uh, was built, and that was his house and his shipyard. Now, other shipbuilders followed. In 1760, we have Nathaniel Cushing, and he bought land, again, from Deacon Dexter, uh, down in the uh, southeast uh, corner of the harbor of Cannonville. And he had his shipyard there. And then Gideon Barstow came and he had a yard at the foot of Mechanic Street. Uh, this is the first round of, of uh, shipyards. They get destroyed at the time of the Revolution and then we get the next crop of shipyards we're more, more familiar with, like Megs and Holmes, okay? This is just the first group that came down and set up their yards. And then Joshua Studley and Seth Barstow came, and they bought land from, actually, uh, Charles Stetson and set up a shipyard in, in Shipyard Park. And these were, as I say, professional shipbuilders. They built ships, not schooners and sloops, uh, anywhere from 90 to uh, 100 uh, tons. Now, why did these people come to Mattapoisett Harbor? Big, uh, deep enough harbor. If I, sometimes when I say it's a deep harbor, they say, oh, it's not deep, it's only 20 feet deep. But that was plenty deep enough for the vessels that we're, we're talking about. Large, deep harbor protected by a bay, right? Now, granted, it gets pretty mean in on a southeaster and a hurricane, but it's not like being uh, uh, facing the open ocean. All right, so they came to Mattapoisett because of its harbor and also because of its timber. Remember we said we had this 70 square mile tract of timberland all the way up through Lakeville. It hadn't all been cleared for agriculture. It was there, so there was ready uh, timber available. And then, of course, the other reason what they were interested in, and I always lump this in as a third one, was there was a huge market for ships what better place than in this harbor right here on uh, Budget's Bay. Uh, do I have time? Uh, one final war, and then I, I'm going to uh, stop because then we'll, we'll move right along into the, uh, into the revolution. Uh, our last and final war <coughs> that will bother these uh, poor colonists. Now we've, we've had three so far. We've had uh, King William's War, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, and now this one is the French and Indian War. Uh, the French and Indian War was also under uh, George II, but this is the war that kicks the French out of Canada once and for all. Of course, if you were in Quebec or Montreal, why well, you wouldn't like me <laughs> saying that. But it was, it was the shortest of the wars. It only lasted, it was known as the Seven Years' War in Europe uh, from uh, 1757 to 1763. And there were battles fought in Quebec and in Montreal. And the French flag folded <laughs> forever, as far as the British were concerned, uh, in Canada. And this was a big boon now for people in our area that for almost a century had been plagued with having to go and fight uh, up onto the frontier and face the French privateers that preyed on our, our trade on our ships and to our detriment. Uh, so with that war, <coughs> with the French in, in Indian War over and the French out of the, out of the pictures and the privateers out of the pictures and the shipbuilders here now in uh, on the harbor front our village began to grow and uh, 
we, by 1755, for example, there were, there were eight or ten homes right on the waterfront and five or six shipyards uh, are building ships. And uh, the center, though, of the great Mattapoisett area, or the greater Mattapoisett area, was still Hammondtown. And they referred to uh, our village here as ye lower town whereas they were ye upper town, right? We were ye lower town uh, here. And of course the Hammonds and the Dexters and the Barlows and the Tinkums and the Randalls and so forth and so forth, they had ready employment here now and so they migrated from their little communities to uh, work in the, in the shipyards. So I'm going to stop here because from here, we uh, build up to the Revolutionary War, and then we have to fight that Revolutionary War, and how it affected uh, Mattapoisett and uh, the surrounding uh, area. As I say, New Bedford got burned in 1778, uh, totally destroyed, annihilated. And uh, then we have to put things back together again and start on what we call the, the, the Golden Age of Mattapoisett shipbuilding, and the age of, uh, of uh, New Bedford's grandeur in the, in the whaling industry. So thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. So chapter three next time, probably September. <laughs>